Welcome to The Hit Show, especially my loyal listeners in The Hit Squad. Here we talk about mastering hit, honesty, integrity, and transparency, and about investing in relational capital to create influence, and then how we wield that to create opportunities to make more money. We also talk about how this relates to a balanced life enterprise and more discretionary time to do the things that you love to do. My name is Stephen Cohen, and they call me the Hitman. And practically, I'm showing you how to reach a better quality of life. This is why I interview the people that I do, because they have it. And they can show it to you, and you can learn it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the Hit Show. Great to have you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today is a great day, as is every day. Why? Because we dictate that from the inside out. Isn't that right? That's how we roll here, Hit Squad. Today on the show, we have a really exciting guest. Neeraj is so interesting because, you know, I had to get him for the show. I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. We actually met in Croatia at an entrepreneur event, baby bathwater. As you may notice, we have the same shirt on, coincidentally, funny enough. I was struck at his passion for personal well-being, but, you know, there's a lot of people that are passionate about personal well-being, but more so, I was interested and intrigued how, how successful he was at incorporating it into the everyday life as a major part of your life where most focus on it as like a bolt-on or an additive, like I'm going to do my meditation and then I'm going to work. And he sort of has this um, whole life concept, which I was super intrigued about. So I wanted to get him on the show. Neeraj Shah is an entrepreneur, stroke survivor, technology enthusiast, meditation guide, and mental well-being speaker. Now, if that doesn't mean much to you, wait, to, wait until you've seen, seen and heard what he's done. It'll blow your mind. As co-founder of Mind Unlocked, of Mind Unlocked, his mission is to uh, make evidence-based, practical mental well-being tools designed for the busy 21st century lives more accessible. Neeraj is also a European co-chair for Silicon Valley's Transformative Technology Lab, Woo-hoo. the leading global community of entrepreneurs using technology to raise mental health and emotional well-being. He combines these interests with a love for travel and snowboarding of all things. So <laughs> Hit Squad, please welcome Neeraj to the show. Thanks so much for being here, buddy. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, cool. Well, and you, you actually are excited. I mean, it's, you know, some people say that, they don't mean it, but I, I can tell by your smile that you're actually excited to be here. You know, when we met in um, Croatia, you know, you meet, we were on an island with 150 people, right? So you meet so many people like, bam, 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 and you're just like, okay, who was that? And boom, you, you just stuck out. You just stuck out. Why do you think you stuck out? Let me ask you that. <laughs> oh, what a question putting me on the spot yes. um i i don't I, like i mean first of all we were on an island with incredible folks there were so many people with amazing stories of either big odds that overcome or just amazing things they'd done in business or in life so um i find it really difficult to answer that question in terms of why i stuck out i, I would say that i think some elements of my story are, are a little bit different um, it, the, the things that are the same is that I, I'm an entrepreneur, as as are pretty much everybody that was on the island, not yeah. pretty much everybody who was on the island. But I, th- I think the the difference is that I hit a bit of personal adversity relatively early in life, and that. Um, incident has actually shaped a lot of what I've gone on to do and it shapes a lot of the mindset and the way that I look right. at the world and ju- just because because we may as well get into it the the incident is that at the age of 30 out of nowhere um, you know li- living a relatively healthy life no, nowhere near the health that I have now but uh, but certainly com- compared to what, what I thought that looked like um, with, with no indication whatsoever I had a full-blown stroke and that, uh, you know, I, at the time, I didn't even really understand what that was. What, what I've since learned is it's a very serious brain injury where, where blood is cut off to the brain. And um, the, the, you know, it's very unlucky that it happened. We don't know why it happened. There's no hereditary. There was no, I wasn't stressed. They um, never found out? They never found yeah, out why? We, we, I mean, of course, there is a reason why it happened, right. but we never found out. And, and the, these things can just happen. They, they, they can just happen. Right. Although the biggest causes of, of this type of thing tend to be hereditary or lifestyle factors. Um, but, but we eliminated all of that. That wasn't, but none of those things really Amazing. applied to me. And I, and I certainly wasn't stressed because I was actively um, trying to leave my employer at the time. And when, when you're actively trying to leave your job, it's not stressful. You're, yeah. you're just happy to get the hell out of there. Right. Um, so uh, I, I guess 
super unlucky that it happened, but very, very lucky in that I've managed to make a pretty much full recovery. And I, I think, you know, within, within a few weeks, uh, my neurologists were telling me that there's a very good chance I am going to make a full recovery. And, and I think that gave me the drive to really make that happen. But the, but the reality is I, I was just really, really scared. I was just so yeah. worried that something like this could happen again, because in that first year, the statistical probability is very, very high. And especially yeah. because they couldn't pinpoint it to, right. uh, okay, this is why it happened. Right. So that's let's go back to that. Point. Let's go back to that suggestive part there. So it's funny you say that. I was thinking about this the other day is that, you know, when a doctor says you have X, Y, Z, immediately you, you, you're believing it, right? You're like, okay, yes. But if they tell you, you'll probably make a full recovery. You'll believe that too. Mm -hmm. So how powerful was that suggestion in helping you you believe how powerful was that suggestion helping you come and overcome you think if, if, if he just said to you i don't think you're going to make a full recovery would you still you think you still would have made that click i i think i would have but it would have been a lot harder so, yeah. so i really agree with you that i i don't think um i don't think he was telling me anything different to what he believed but yeah. i think the combination of that you, you know because i didn't know much about it at the time right. i didn't really understand what had happened so to hear that from the experts in in that field that gave me yeah. huge impetus to you, you know when, when things were tough to keep keep pushing with the recovery keep doing the physical therapy or all, all of those kind of things so i th I, th I think it's huge actually I, yeah. I think that's massive it's it comes down to i think what you're getting at is that our beliefs have such a huge impact on our behaviors. Yep. Completely what I'm talking about. And, and especially someone who's overcome like this, I, I always like to dig deep to find out what tips can you give to someone like, cause like I said, if a doctor, and, and sometimes that makes me wonder why they say the things they say, even in dire situations, you want to give people hope and not, you know, the, the, the negativity or hopelessness. And it's always a, an issue that I have when I'm talking to people that are you know, talking to sick people or helping people trying to recover and they use that negative language. Like, well, you never know and you got to be careful, which you do, but everyone knows that anyway. So what do you say? I mean, how, you know, how do you talk to people in a positive tone all the time? That's what I always try to figure out. So when you said that, that really triggered like, wow, you know, I wonder how much of a difference that really made because a specialist who diagnosed you told you you can make it full recovery. That's like, a, that's like an adrenaline boost, isn't it? Uh, f for sure, because yes. it, w w w in those dark moments when things are difficult, that kn knowing that, well, 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 you know, the specialist has said this, so I just need to do the work now. I just need right. to, uh, you know, sort of, sort of keep doing what, what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, th there's a good chance I'll make a full recovery. Um, and and I've, I've made a nearly full recovery. I, 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 I can do almost everything that I could do before. And the, and the bits that I can't are like, that don't even affect my day to day right, life. Right. So what, what I would say, I mean, I think, I think every health issue is personal and nuanced. So of course, some of them do come with limitations, right. but I think, I think what we underestimate is our ability to maneuver within whatever those limitations might be. And I think what, what, you know, one of my favorite books is um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, because yeah. it was such an ultimate um, expression of how much personal agency we can have in the most dire circumstances. And I think that's helped me a lot in terms of business and entrepreneurship, because when things get tough, then yeah. I've always got that paradigm to go back to that model to go back to and say, okay, th th there's a bunch of things here that I can't control, but, but we have so much control o over uh, what we Many can. Many other control. things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk about that controlling what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the last thing that I remember you doing, uh, was London Bridge, big London Bridge event, mm -hmm. which um, if anyone doesn't know, which I doubt watching this, London Bridge is like the center of London. It's like the... the, the it's like one the of the iconic, iconic places. The iconic places in London. So what'd you do on <laughs> the London <laughs> Bridge, man? Oh, this was, this was so cool. I was, I was so grateful to be asked to do this. So the, um, as, as part of like kind of climate change awareness and that kind of thing, they shut down various parts of the city. And um, one of the things that, uh, that, that came about from this was that they wanted to lead a mass yoga meditation practice for about uh, 1500 people, something like that. So, so shut down the bridge 
and lay yoga mats on the whole thing. So um, a dear friend of mine was running, running the yoga session and she's one of London's best. And um, they, they asked me to run the meditation session, which was unbelievable. It was, it was you know, I, I, I've led a lot of group meditations, but not for 1500 people and, and not, not on the middle of London. <laughs> when, when they first told me, I thought, oh yeah, it will just be like this little bit on the side, yeah. you know, like the grass on the side or something like that. And, and, and then it's only after we had the first discussion that it dawned on me they're going to place a circular stage on the middle of the dam bridge wow wow and there you were how, how, how many people showed up and how did it go i think we had about a thousand in the end so talking about things we can and can't control what we couldn't control is that in in late august hey welcome to london it was raining so uh the, we the weather forecast wasn't great so uh we had about a thousand people show up it, it was fantastic the just to be given that opportunity, things like that don't phase me because I know that when it comes to things like leading guiding meditation, I have, I, I have done hundreds and hundreds of hours of work and training and experience. I, I was ready for it and I loved every moment and it went really well. I, I, I would give myself probably compared to if, if what I wanted to do was a 10 out of 10, I, I, I think on the day it was something like a nine, which, which, which I'm awesome. really happy with. Congratulations, man. Thank you. So let's talk about that business you're in because that is your business, correct? Yep, correct. And, you, and I remember we, we spoke on the island. You said that it sort of happened. It didn't, you didn't really like, it just sort of yeah, took off. It was, it was an interesting one because, um, so, so the business we're in is really making mental well-being accessible to busy folks. And the way that we do that is, uh, so this is entrepreneurs and, and freelancers and people with busy jobs who, who want to solve their problems around stress, anxiety, insomnia, right. not clinical conditions. They're just things that you and I would deal with on, a, on a, you know, on, and everybody deals with on a regular basis. Um, and the way in which we do that is we take a very evidence-based and practical approach because I know that a lot of things in this space, um, that they can be quite wishy-washy. They, they can be quite esoteric. And that's not, that's not to say that they don't work. It's just that I knew there was a subset of people, quite a large subset of people who are outside of the wellness industry, yep. who go to yoga studios, don't want to go to the Buddhist center, aren't ready for plant medicine and all, all of these, these things that I, I think in the future will potentially have some really good evidence behind yep. them or, or, or they may not. They, they just want to go to w where the studies have already shown right. what has a high probability of working right. because it, the science gives somebody the excuse to walk through the door. And what we find is once somebody, once somebody's had the experiential benefits, yeah. they don't care about the science. They just want yeah. to solve their problem. Right. So we do stuff around meditation, around digital balance. Um, we're starting to move a little bit more into mindset optimization, but it's always with this filter of research-led, practical, no fluff. I love it. It's sort of like um, you're straddling two worlds and you're bringing them together. And, and exactly. that's sort of what we try to do or what we do with the Humble Alpha um, a book and program that we have is, we're showing those who would never go to a, you know, an event with people wearing gowns and jewels and, you know, singing whatever they sing every day or whatever. So it's, it's, it's good to see that just, it's coming more to mainstream. I think it all started, if you ask me, with The Secret, the book. As cheesy as it can be for some people and as, as unbelievable it can be for others, it literally brought the two worlds together. I mean, that was probably the most impactful book as far as bringing spirituality and healing and meditation and all that stuff to the mainstream than anything that I've in my lifetime, I think. Because millions and millions of been millions of people read that book and said, wait a second, there's something else outside. There's something else outside of me that's bigger than me that I can actually control. So it's like, wow, I can manifest these things. But the, the secret was famous for not saying how to do it. <laughs> You know, so, <laughs> so everybody's like, wait a second, it's not working. I'm guessing I want a million dollars in my account. Well, you got to work for that. Um, that so, that's the bit, um, you know, the, the, the secrets. I, I, I haven't read it, but I know what it's about. And I think it was both the, like one of the most positive things and one of the most frustrating things. It was positive because it opened a whole bunch of yep. people to the idea that there's more out there. And th there's a whole bunch of unexplained things out there as well, which, uh, you know, which are, which are time changing. But the bit that it left out is that you got to do something as you well. You got to work. You got to do something. You yeah. got, and, and, and of course, that doesn't sell as well as sit no. at home and. Yeah. yeah. Exactly what we said. It, it's funny. Um, um, that I read the book back when it first came out and it was like, Oh man, this is amazing. 
And then I got into other things and I've, I realized really quick that this, you got to do something still. So thank goodness I'm a self-driven person like you are. So where's all this going? I mean, where's this going now? Where, cause you have, as you're talking about science-based, you use like, um, from Dave, Dave Rab, um, Rabin, the Apollo, uh, or you have, uh, you know, um, Dan Clark, brain FM. These are all external things that, that help someone get to a phase of relaxation, meditation, whatever it is. Do you incorporate any wearables in your program? So the exciting thing is not yet. Um, we, we started in a very simple way. So what we've done is we, t we took the existing body of research um, around meditative practice originally because there's so much of it and sifted through it and picked out what's actually robust, what's, you know, wh wh where, are the, where are the trials of uh, sufficient quality, uh, as opposed to, again, the wellness industry is very, right. very good at saying, science says or studies have shown but it doesn't you know like like nobody's questioning well which studies where were they right. done who did it what was the limitations so all, all, all we did what initially was i sat down and sifted through a whole bunch of research and picked out well this is rock solid and that isn't and, and whatever and used that to start forming a bit of a thesis around well actually different meditative practices have different effects for us. Some help us with focus, some help with creativity, some are better for stress reduction, some are better for sleep. So that was the starting point was this um, wow. realization that meditation is an umbrella term for a bunch of different practices. And, and once we accept that, a bit like exercise or sports, right. once we accept, accept that, then we realize that there's no one size fits all solution. Um, my, you know, the, the, you may like boxing, I might like swimming, somebody else might like yoga they have different pros and cons but what's right. the mo the most important thing is that people do something right they, they, they have some sort of re regular movement practice and we found a similar thing with meditative practice it's not so much what the practice is it's more that Doing people it. find something that's going to suit their lifestyle so um to go off on a slight tangent but this is going to make sense in a second um we get asked a lot what kind of meditation should i do or how should i meditate and the, answer to that question is the one that you're going to do the one that's going to fit into your lifestyle the one that's going to fit into right. your patterns as opposed to these big blanket statements like you must meditate twice a day or you must meditate at 6 a.m or yeah. you must meditate with intention so where where we started and this is something you were alluding to before is that this kind of happened a little bit by accident it started as a side project um, whilst I was exploring, whilst I was trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm going to do next, right? I, I knew I wanted to do something in the wellness space. I, I thought it might be meditation related. So whilst I was figuring what that looks like, knowing I wanted it to be mostly kind of digital and global, I thought, well, let me test this hypothesis around if we make this practical, research-led and, and delve a bit deeper are people interested? Are they going to come? Are they going to come back? Are they going to spend right. money? So I started an event series. We did three events to test the water. They went well, three turned to 10, 10 turned to 20. Yeah. And, and then over the course of a year, 20 turned to 70. And we got sponsorship from the Evening Standard and, and ASICS, but, you know, big, big, big shoe company. Um, and that was a point where I, I knew I had something yeah. here, but I still wasn't sure if I wanted to pursue it. And then I met my co-founder, and her coming on board gave the impetus to say, okay, now we've got the skill set and drive that we need to really turn this into a proper digital right. business, which, so, which we're still on that path. So it's still early days. So you're, you're a tech guy basically, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not a hardcore programmer, but I yeah. understand tech. Right. Um, right. And uh, so where we're at at the moment is that, you know, we've written one online course, that online course has done well. It's how to build your personalized meditation habits um we so going back to what you're saying we're not even integrating with wearables yet we're not we're not really harvesting data when we start doing those things what we do starts becoming more exciting because at the moment it's quite user driven it's quite you've got right. to be motivated whereas whereas um in the future it will integrate with all this stuff and when you start using our programs after a couple of weeks use they will come back to you and say Hey, Stephen, based on your lifestyle, based on this, based on that, this is what we think you should do. Right. That, that's, so, we're, that's, we're that's amazing. So, so what's the difference between the meditation that you're doing and the other meditation besides uh, the fact-based, fact-driven? Is I there think, a, a different practice? Do you, do you think differently or do you not worry about thinking or what's the difference? Yeah. 
So, so we, we, take a, we take a holistic view of the meditation space rather than adhering to one type of meditation. So um, for example, within a course, we actually um, share seven different styles, but we structure it and layer it in a way so that they build on each other. And, and by the end of, the, end of that period, the, um, the person who's been doing the course, they, they will have all the tools to understand wow. this is how I should meditate and have experience of all these different things. So it's quite, kind of almost like an exercise 101 program. Right. For right. And then the other thing is it's, it's 15 minutes a day. So it's designed for really busy people. Yeah. So that's about all I do anyway, 15 yeah, minutes a that, day. That's, that's the learning and the meditation. That's like oh wow the, the right. whole piece. So and that's really important. So, I mean, take us through it. What's, what does it look like? Because a lot of people think I can't stop thinking and yeah. other ones say you don't have to worry about thinking. You can think if you want. I mean, what, take us through there. What do you think? What's, what's... So, so, so we thought about this long and hard. We've tested it. We've iterated it. We've, we've had a lot of user feedback. So phase one is getting started, even for experienced meditators. So it addresses all that stuff around how to sit, um, what do I do with my thoughts? Uh, you know, all, all, all the big questions that come up, like what happens when a thought pops into my head? Um, is this right? Is that right? Because the biggest issue for, for newer meditators is I don't know if I'm doing it right. Yeah. So that's phase one, getting started and getting start starting with, with these habits, right? Phase two, and, and that, that typically takes about a week, but again, it's self-directed. So you could do it in two days or you could do it in and, 20 days. And it is partially, it has to partially become a habit or a full habit, doesn't it? That's, yeah. that's where you really let go and it becomes automatic. Like I got to get up now, I'm getting up, I'm going to go meditate without thinking about it. Is that? It, 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 exactly. So, so we're taking somebody from, it, it's designed to take a complete newcomer, but we find that most people who, who come into the program, they've had a little bit of experience, right. usually with an app like Headspace or Calm or something like that. Right. And, and we actually recommend those as, as good starter platforms. Um, so, so phase one is just getting started. Phase two is where we expose people to a bunch of different styles and different benefits linked to those. So you don't just do, do the meditation, but you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and what, what the research behind that is and what the practical outcome looks like. Um, and then phase three is bringing it all together so that um, you can then integrate that. We do do some behavioral change stuff. We do some habit formation stuff so that at the end of that phase, you, you've, you can pull it all together and you know how, where to go, you, you know, what right. meditation should look like for you. Now, the thing, the bit that's missing, which we're working on now is, is the next step, which is we found that a lot of people have said, actually, we'd like some further direction. We want some longer meditations. We want some, we want right. this, we want that. So we're actually building all those features right now before we relaunch the thing. What, um, what's the proposed outcome of meditation? Like if you say, this is what you're supposed to get out of it. What is it? Yeah. I think, I think it's different for everybody, but we find that most people come to it because they want to feel less stressed or less anxious or solve something around insomnia. But those are the biggest. So, right. so what we focus on is how to solve those problems, not how to meditate. The, the, the meditation piece is just a really strong foundational habit, which has huge benefits for attention, focus, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, so let's give you a sense. I have a stressful day coming at work. My boss is on my back. I sit down and meditate and I think about that. I work through it or how does it, what, or how do you mean? So you're saying like I work through my stress while meditating and the meditation is like the bowl I'm sitting in and I'm sort of working myself. Is that, is that what you mean? Or? So, so what, what we mean is that for somebody to come into the course, because it's, it's, it's not a cheap course, right? We, we, um, it, it, it was, I think at the moment it, it was last at, at about $125 and we're going to relaunch it at a higher price point than that. $25 for what each? So, so that, 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 that's for the whole course, but that's for an audio only course, which is you know, sort of 15 modules. It's not. That's, that's well, lunch. But, compa <laughs> compared to, but compared to an app, it's expensive. Okay. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's twice the price of any. I gotcha. You know, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so within its market it's expensive. So if somebody's coming to us, they're coming to us because they're already motivated to want to, I, you know, they already know they want to get better at meditation to help them solve these problems. But what I'm asking though is a little bit different because for instance, there's people out there that are stressed every day and they're like, yeah, you know, even, even yesterday I was, I was, I don't even know why I, my head was, doesn't want, it wasn't on right. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I was at the gym. I'm like, I'm not feeling it, man. What's going on. I'm trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. So I came and meditated and worked it out. 
Now, I don't know if I worked it out or the meditation worked it out, but I did something because afterwards I was super happy, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm asking you. Is there an intentional way to say, I'm going to focus on my, my, my issue and work through it? Or do I just mm -hmm. let go and say the meditation is going to take care of it? Is that even possible? I don't even know. Yeah. So the, it, it's a really good question. I understand it now. Um, so with most meditative practices, um, not, not all of them, but with most of them, they will have a bunch of physiological outcomes. And those physiological outcomes are, are the ones that affect our nervous system to start lowering our heart rate, lowering our blood pressure, bringing the blood back to the brain, basically counteracting the effects of adrenaline and cortisol, which, which is what happens when we get stressed, which is right. what happens when right. we hit fight or flight. So when somebody builds a meditation practice, whether that's four times a week or six times a week or three times a week or whatever it is, it's a bit like building mental muscle, mental resilience. Okay. So we're less susceptible to um, stress responses in the first place and we're better able to deal with them afterwards. Wow. So but literally so you're deals with it both in the moment and as a baseline. Wow. See, that's cool. I've never heard anyone say that about meditation. I actually, I'm, I mean, I, med I meditate for years, but mm -hmm. I might not be good at it, but I meditate for years. It seems to help me. Um, I usually use guided meditation. I think I'm too, yeah. which, which is great, which is great. Yeah. I've, I've heard it being said, you know, we talk about meditation myths. I've heard it being said that if it's guided, you're not doing it properly. Well, let, let, let me ask a question. If, if exercise is guided, does that mean you're not doing it properly? It's ridiculous. I love it. <laughs> See, that's where the tech guy comes in. Logic, man. Logic. I love it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, because it's so fascinating for me. When I, when I was in the monastery, I spent some time in the monastery in Austria, like eight months. And uh, I was meditating there. I didn't even remember. It was, I would sit down and six hours would go by in a wow. blink of an eye. Well, wow. I, I didn't have anything to do. I was there for eight months and didn't have a job, didn't have a phone, didn't have a laptop, nothing. So I just completely ignored, basically disappeared from society. And then I thought, well, I can, I can replicate that. I've done it before. I can't replicate that anymore. It's impossible because of all the outside influences. But I like what you're saying about you actually building up, almost um, building up a re resistance to the outside world when you, the more you meditate. Mental muscle. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's, not, that's not just an analogy. That's been shown. It's real. Yeah. Through, you know, that's been shown through physical development in the brain. One of the most exciting things is that, um, the, the discovery that our brains don't stop developing in adulthood. So, you know, we, we can see when somebody does some deliberate meditation practice, we can see how their brain changes. And that's yeah. actually quite exciting. Well, and, and it's, I mean, I don't know. I've heard this. Like the frontal lobe is, a, I don't know, don't quote me if I'm wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that the frontal lobe's um, responsible for creating new habits and learning new things, right? Somehow it's like that's where the fire goes when you're learning new habits. And that's why they say that a lot of people who do the same thing for 35 years and, you know, they have the same job and they go home every night and that stuff, that the dementia sits in or, or Alzheimer's. And that, that one of the things, one of the ways to um, sort of beat out or resi resist against Alzheimer's or dementia is always to be, you know, working with your frontal lobe which is learning new things meditation and things like that have you heard any of that science yeah it's um it's uh, i i have and the, i think in terms of useful things to share about it that the, the basic thing to remember is if especially as we get older if we don't use it we lose it it's the lose same it. the same as phys, you know physical muscle um I, you know a, a mutual friend of ours andy fawcett he gave me this amazing yeah. shirt and it says on it entropy always wins and i thought that is just the most that there's there's very few fundamental profound truths in the world yeah. but that's one of them that's and one that's, of them that, that's absolutely you know um the more we do something the more it creates like a bit of a groove in the brain metaphorically right and um that's why when we get into habits they're harder to shift and that's why bad habits are hard to shift but going back to that thing about the frontal lobe the, the, the frontal part of the brain is the newer part of the brain and the back is is the more of the reptilian brain. So when we go into fight or flight, this the back takes over. That's when we go to instinct. Yeah. That's you know that that's when but but the the thinking part is the front, the 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 logic, the creativity, the um having the human experience. So if we don't use it in a variety of ways, then we'll lose those abilities as we age. So yeah, wow man. This is fascinating. So what's, what's next? Are you, you're building this up. You're going to have wearables. You're going to be more research. Anything else on the horizon? Uh, I think, I think, you know, for us, it's really, really early days. We just, uh, you, you know, it's, it's barely been year one. So year one was figuring out what the hell we're doing. And what, what I mean by that is 
of really understanding our audience, understanding where their pain points are, really building something valuable that they actually want to use. So, so we validated all that. So that now I think it's about growing and reaching more people. Got, we've got a, another thing up coming, which is uh, I, I get asked to speak about digital balance more than anything else, which is really? the, yeah, the relationship between technology and the human brain because right. it's an evolving relationship. And I, you know, I, I'm in a privileged position because I get to see so much in that space and, and it's my nerd out subject. So um, I'm developing a workshop on that because we've, we've already done that for some big corporates like EEY, Cisco, people like that. So um, I, I know there's a big, big demand on, on the public side. So, so from our side, it's to continue to be a consumer facing brand, um, keep spreading the word globally, uh, bring more you know, people into our ecosystem. And really, I, th I think you know, what we're doing isn't for everybody, but if somebody's quite motivated and um, doesn't have a lot of time on their hands, then they're the perfect person for us. I, I think it, if you ask me, I think for today's world, the people that aren't into meditation or into that world yet, this is the first step that I would suggest because yeah. it's, it's, you have that logic fact basing where they don't have to completely let go and believe in, you know, unicorns or whatever. Yeah. We don't but, have to start chanting and wearing robes and all yeah, that. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Massively <laughs> off putting for the vast majority of people. Exactly what I'm saying. Exactly what I'm saying. Hey, I just wanted to remind everybody where you're watching the hit show with Stephen Cohen and we're here with Neeraj Shav of, uh, mindunlocked.co go ahead and grab your free quick start guide to building a meditation habit that works for you mindlocked.co winding it down my friend um you're sitting in london right now mm -hmm. yeah good yeah. good to know i got some good friends in london great 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 place to be so if there's anything you could say let's let's say i mean you've dropped a lot of bombs here so i mean is there anything you could say to the hit squad um that's going to help them today right now deal with the stress they have in their lives I'd, I'd say as a medium term thing the very best thing you can do is develop a meditation habit that said i know that's not that straightforward so what what i would say is um just make sure you have some switch off time make make sure you have some time away from technology some time away from work some some time with your loved ones and and i, th I think probably i'll leave you with this when you're doing something, just do that thing. That, that's probably the biggest issue that I see in so many people today that they're try, trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're watching, they're, they're having dinner with their, with their family whilst they're distracted by their phone or they're, um, you know, instead of being fully distracted in their phone, they've got one eye on work or something like that. Right. So I think, you know, one, one of the biggest mantras that's helped me a lot in, um, in, in my life is just trying to, be singularly focused on the thing I'm trying to do in the time I'm trying to do that. It's, it's almost this idea of make that thing, my meditation become consumed by it. Do that thing, be that thing, do it properly or don't do it at all. Man, that's tough. That's tough, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's really tough. I mean, especially yeah. like sitting right here, just as an example, we're talking, I'm trying to ignore the beeps and the blips and the, the pops and the poops, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, you're, you're like this, right? It's tough today. But so that's, that's a, that's a tall order, but it does make sense. I mean, I stopped, you know, our phones are forbidden on, on the dinner table, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I had to go that far because I, I, I myself would be like, you know, look down. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me give you, let me give you something a, a lot easier to start okay. that journey, okay. which is environmental change. So you, you, you've hit on it there. So being disciplined is really difficult. And actually I don't really advocate it because, because we get tired. Um, but if we change the environment, so we just take the phones away from a dinner table. Now we can't be distracted. So every time it, every time we reach for it, we, we, it has that pattern interrupt. So, yep. uh, you know, for a big one for me, I, I love eating junk. I love eating chocolates. I love eating crisps, but I don't eat that much of it because we don't keep it at home. So it means right. I have to go out and, and buy it. And, and then I'm always questioning, well, hang on, do I really want to do this? Yeah. And that, that, that nine times out of 10, it means I don't. And once or twice a week I'll indulge. And you know, what we do once or twice a week isn't, isn't what's going to kill exactly. us. It's what we do every exactly. day. Man, awesome advice. I love it. Um, I really, I really uh, enjoyed this, this uh, conversation. I can't wait to see you. You're going to be in Italy with baby bathwater? I'll be in Italy and New Orleans. So. Oh, wow. I'm, I, won't be, I won't make it to New Orleans, but I'll be in Italy for sure. So Italy we'll, I'm looking forward to. Yeah. yeah, that should be fun. A whole village. That should be fun. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, brother. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really Thanks looking for forward to this. Me. Of course. My absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward uh, to seeing your success uh, drive onward. So have a, have a fantastic one. And Hit Squad, if you want to see us when we speak, run over to my YouTube channel to watch this episode and subscribe and share. Just go to youtube.com slash Stephen Eugene Kuhn. 
and grab your copy of our new book, Unleash Your Humble Alpha at humblealphabook.com. Until next time, I wish you all the best. And remember, it's all about quality of life. See you next time.